This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Theology of Everyday Life, Lesson 9, Food, Scarcity, and Abundance. Remember for this series, uh, what is common seems to be normal, and what is normal seems to be right. Uh, last week we started looking into food, or last two weeks. Was it the last two weeks or just last week? Just last week. And um, we started looking into the aspect of food in the Bible. Does anybody remember how many times food is mentioned in the Bible? Yeah, 1,501 times is it? it's mentioned in over... That's how many verses it shows up in, and within those verses, it's like 2,000 sometimes it's mentioned. So, the commandments? Yeah, 13. Yeah. So, the Bible has a lot to say about food. And does anybody remember what book of the Bible had the most to say about food? It was Leviticus, yes. So, all the food laws. So, anyway. What is common seems to be normal, and what is normal seems to be right. In our culture today, when dealing with food, uh, what is common seems normal, and what is normal seems to be right, but it isn't always the case. So let me introduce this lesson a little bit. Now, historically, and this is getting outside of the Bible a little bit, I understand that, but we looked last week how God designed us as needing food, right? Now, historically, civilizations can only thrive when there's an abundance of food. Now, why do you think that is? Why is it important that there be more food than you actually need in order for a civilization to survive, or to thrive? They can survive without the abundance, but they will not thrive without abundance of food. Okay. 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 If you look at when we have a, a hurricane and all the plundering that goes on, people can't mm-hmm. work. Yeah. And then if it's a thriving country, then or if they have abundance, then they're able to sell or you know, buy sell with other Okay, that that's part of it. See, when there's enough food that not everybody's scraping the bottle and barrel to make sure they're fed, what happens is it allows food to be sold. Because if I produce enough food that I can't eat all the food I produce, what am I going to do with the excess? I'm going to sell it. And as that begins to take place, so, and there we get into the farming. Some people are into the cattle. Some people are into the the crop farming. And that's the way it was in ancient um, Mesopotamia. Um, As they thrive with food production, it allows for other people to do other things besides food production. So if you don't have to be a farmer or a, a, a rancher, you can be, in our term, you can be a mechanic. And today, a mechanic does nothing to produce food. I mean, he might have a garden of his own or something, but they don't produce food, but they produce a service that people are willing to pay for. And that's societies built because then people can start to specialize in something, okay? Uh, this is more of a history of civ lesson right now <laughs> than, a, than a church lesson, I guess. Um, but as a, as a result, through history, famines have caused the death of millions when a famine takes place. Now, why does that not affect us today maybe as much as it did 2,000 years ago? Even in a thriving civilization like Mesopotamia or Egypt, why was a famine so bad back then where it's today it may not be quite as bad? 
Okay, we have the ease of getting food. What do you mean by wherever? Okay, you have the transportation yeah. and food storage. We have better ways of feeding. They didn't they couldn't preserve food like we could. They can't they couldn't freeze the food, they couldn't refrigerate the food. Um, so the food could not be stored like we store it today. Uh, not to mention the fact that we've pumped it so full of preservatives, bread lasts for two or three weeks without getting moldy. So um, that probably has a big factor. And for your interest, that's probably thanks to Napoleon Bonaparte, who said, I will reward the baker in France who can give me bread that will last more than a week. And um, I think he had a, if a loaf of bread could last two weeks without going bad, because he wanted bread to carry with his armies. And some baker in France figured if you bleach the flour, it'll last longer. So that is how we got white bread. Yeah, if it wasn't him, it was somebody else. All for military advantage. So to bring it back, historically, food is very important for a civilization to thrive. And without it, and even with like a famine, it tends to uh, cause massive problems. Now, this is also true in Galilee during Christ's day. Now, Galilee, as the northern part of Israel, was controlled by the Romans, and they were under great oppression. They were very poor. And I forgot... The verse there is at the bottom of the page, kind of the key verse for this little series. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Um, so in Galilee, in Christ's day, food was not a huge, abundant resource. Now, what, were, what was the occupation of several of the disciples? They were fishermen, okay? So they probably had plenty of fish, but what did they do with their fish? They sold it so they could pay for clothing and other things. Um, so they would only eat about two meals a day, and they would only eat meat about once to twice a week. Now, um, as the Bible Dictionary put it, meat was neither an unknown luxury nor a cornerstone of the average diet. I'll just put that in perspective. Between Christ's day in Galilee and today, how often have you eaten meat this week? We eat every meal. <laughs> okay, every meal because of because of the blood sugar thing. Uh, did you say every day? Yeah. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but uh, a part of that also is the preserving of it. I mean, the best way to preserve meat used to be to keep it on four legs walking, um, but that only goes for so many. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that is that is another element, which probably why we eat meat more often is, well, when we were in Uganda, um, the missionaries there had, they called it Clucking Hen Palace, and um, it was a building they had made for housing the chickens, so they had chickens, and and then you had the whole process of butchering and taking care of the chicken before you could actually even cook it to eat it. It was much more difficult than going to Walmart and pulling a bag out of the freezer section. It took a lot more time, a lot more energy, a lot more effort. It sure tasted good. It did taste good. And those were some of the biggest, those chickens were so big, they were about as big as a turkey. Was, he had some really nice big pieces of meat. So it took, it takes more work Generally, I mean, we for us to go to the grocery store and spend what's a bag of chicken cost? Five, Fifteen dollars for five pounds of chicken, and that's eliminating all the work of processing. And um, so, it's life has been much made much easier for us over time. Um, but in a, in in essence, there was not a lot of excess food, and food storage would have been an issue. Now. Keeping that in mind, we go back even farther in the Bible. Proverbs 30, we have King Lemuel um, in the Proverbs. This is not actually by Solomon, but Solomon put it in Proverbs. He makes this statement in Proverbs 30, verses 7 to 9. He says, Two things have I, have I required thee, talking about petitions to God. Deny me them not before I die. 
Remove far from me vanity and lies, neither give me poverty nor riches. Feed me with food that is convenient for me, lest I be full, and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal, and take the name of my God in vain. He's asking for two things here in regards to food. What are the two things he's asking, and what are the fruit of those two things he's asking for? Okay. He's asking just for enough for what he needs, the, the con- what is convenient, what is needful for him. What does he point out as excesses? Maybe before... Poverty or riches. Okay. Now let's pull in what Philippians said from Paul. I know how, how I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Uh, I like what one person said. He said, we should thank God for plenty, as Paul said in Philippians 4.12, and enjoy it. If we have less, then we should, in, in that case, we should strive for contentment. So, so between Philippians and Proverbs here, if we don't have enough food, what is our temptation? Okay. <laughs> to get it how? <laughs> to steal, right? Okay. Right. Now, what did what did the verse say? It said something else about it. Okay, there is a there is a murmuring and a complaining and an attitude of anger and dissatisfaction with God when we don't have enough food. Can you think of any biblical instances of that? The children of Israel going through the the the, the wilderness. They complained about food. In fact, they complained so much to the point that they said, man, our taskmasters in Egypt, put this in perspective, you have the God of the universe who's caring for you, parting the Red Sea and sending manna for you. Our taskmasters in Egypt fed us better than the God of Israel. We remember the leeks and the onions and the garlic. And Now, do you really think as slaves they got the best end of the deal? No, of course not. So... The, the, the first temptation when it comes to food is if we don't have enough, we become angry or bitter at God. We can fall into a, dis, a state of dis, despair, and we can resort to stealing to satisfy hunger. Proverbs 6.30 says, Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. What does that mean? Men do not despise a thief. When he's, <laughs> okay. They realize the desperation of it. This verse comes in a context also, which, not that I pulled it out of context, but I didn't give you all the context. Come, it's in contrast to a man who commits adultery because he's taking another man's wife um, and there, it's not, you don't have pity on that situation as much. You have pity on the guy who steals food because he's, he's starving and he's hungry, but the man who steals another man's wife, you don't have the pity. And um, if you're going to put it maybe in a phrase that's helpful, you don't justify the actions, but you understand your understanding. We can easily let our understanding get to the point that we don't let justice be administered, uh, but we can we can also do the opposite where we want justice so bad we're not understanding uh, of the situation. So uh, that is a temptation that Proverbs brings up a couple different places of when you're hungry, it leads to the temptation to steal for the food, which is, which is wrong. Now let's talk a little bit about the nature of temptation. Temptation to steal food, is food something God has given us? Yes, it's, it's something we need. 
if we're tempted to steal, it's not that God does not want us to have food. It's that we're, we are getting food the wrong way or at the wrong time or from the wrong place. Does that make sense? Um, those who would steal for food rather than, let's say, work for food, or rather than, you know, actually go out and get food. You know, in that day, they had the corners of the field that they could go reap and glean, and they had the olive trees they could go and get some food. And there was public trees. You know, you read in, um, in the New Testament when the disciples were walking, remember the story where they picked the corn off the ears? It's common for the edges of the field to just be... I mean, we don't think of it this way, but passers-by could just pick an ear and eat it. Now, if you picked a basket full and took it home, that was considered stealing. But if you took an ear off the, the stock and ate it on your way by, that was, not, that was considered kosher or fine. Uh, if you, there were fruit trees, such as the fig tree they passed by going into Jerusalem. Those were considered public property. You know, you could go get food from there. So someone who's stealing for food has decided, look, I'm tempted, it's a need God has given me, but I'm going to satisfy that need in the wrong way. And it shows that instead of looking to God, we look to our own means, and we we fall prey to sin. Comments, questions? The second um, danger or temptation that Lemuel brings up He says, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Now, I kind of reversed him from the way he put him. But when we have too much food, what do we tend to do? We tend to waste it. Okay. What else do we do with it? Okay. (laughs) Yes, back to our food preservation. When we have excess food, we can it and store it. Um. When we have too much, don't we tend to look at we have provided for ourselves? We So what she's saying is when when we have enough food, we kind of get dull. When we have too much food, I'm sorry, yeah, we we fail to depend on God. I think of Matthew 5 in the Beatitudes. Uh, let's see here. I think verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst. Now, this is not physical because it says after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Um, There's an aspect where when you have to pray and when you have to seek God for your food, you have to walk with God moment by moment, day by day. You see every meal as a blessing from God. But when the food is in the refrigerator and in the cupboard, do you look at every meal as hand given by God. Uh, In the Lord's Prayer, something that we we can pray and we kind of have to, in our culture, we end up re-kind of interpreting what it means, but it says, give us this day our daily bread. Now, we tend to wrap that in an American culture thing and say, you know, God, give us our daily necessities. And the reason we do that is because, Why? We have our bread. I've got maybe two or three loaves in the cupboard. There's more at the grocery store, and we're we're generally not so poor. We can't get a you know at least a cheap loaf of bread. Now there's some nice breads that we may not buy, but we we have enough that we're not seeking the Lord for every meal. Uh, My family's been gone now for what two and a half weeks. I have not gone to the grocery store except to buy dog food. That's how much abundance of food is in our house. Um, so that it's easy for us in that to forget God. But when we're dependent, when, we, when our stomach is telling us, you're hungry, 
and it's growling and it's rumbly and you haven't eaten for maybe a day and a half or so and you're praying, Lord, give me food for the next meal, you tend to have greater faith because you see God provide in little things where we tend to forget God and we can even refuse to recognize God. It can be a form of pride of, you know, look what I've accomplished. I've earned this status in life or I've done this so well. I think of uh, the, the parable of the, the rich or the, the farmer in the, in the Gospels who he, he has a bumper crop that year. And he says, I'm going to tear down my barns and I'm going to build more and, and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And this is, he was content in his riches and yet he was called a fool because the Lord said, This day thy soul shall be, or this night your soul will be required of thee. So he had, he had his food and he was content in that. He had his provision for many years and he neglected God. And he was proud of what he had done and we can very much do the same thing. Comments or questions before the cool says, yeah, uh, that's Paul said that was that in Philippians? Can't remember. Godliness with contentment is great gain. All right, quote at the bottom of page three: We take pride in our own provision, the money we've earned with our strength or hard work in our career. And we can easily think, I've earned this for myself. I'm going to indulge in it. Does that quote not ring with some of the advertising slogans of today? <laughs> yeah. You kick cack. Uh, you, something about, you give me a break. Uh, um, McDonald's, let's see, there's this, I'm loving it. Uh, what's? Have it your way. Oh, have it your way. Is that Burger King? Okay. Um, and you'll see. You know, you deserve this shake. You deserve this. You deserve that. And it preconditions us to expect it, right? Now, some of us who may be older and a little bit more penny pinchers, we're like, mm, no. <laughs> but that message constantly being in front of us or our children or grandchildren, have, has it in society had an effect on our society? <laughs> it doesn't always work. Why not? <laughs> when we had a kid that said, Kit Kat bars don't really make that noise, so I'm not ever eating them. I re might be a little off topic, but I remember a while back, this has been several years ago, somebody got stranded um, and it was winter and it was a survival situation. And um, the one piece of food they had was a Snickers. So guess guess what? Snickers played that one up of, you know, Snicker had all the nutrition he needed for blah, blah. It's like, really? Really? Um, anyway. Top of page four there, as Americans... Which of these temptations do you think we fall into the most? The two we've mentioned so far as a society. And, and how does it play out in our society? Are we tempted to be to curse God because of what we don't have regarding food? Or are we tempted to forget God? Okay, we're tempted to forget God. And yet, yes, with a hurricane or something, we get to see the other too. Um, I even think back to Y2K. Yeah. <laughs> um, my, my brother in law had like, we counted them, 850 some cans of tuna on the shelf. And I, about that many of tomatoes, and I don't know what all, and barrels of water, and a generator. And it's like, if you're the only place in Denver that has a life and food, you're not going to live to enjoy it because They're people get desperate and they'll come in and thunder and they yeah. might get killed in the process. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That and that's still going on. There's there's talk of you know America's going to have a another crash and it's going to be worse than the cra uh, economic crash back in the 20s, um, and we've had recessions and whatever since then. But 
they're talking about an enormously bad crash and so they're marketing this is what you buy to store up in preparation for whatever um, you know who are we depending on now I'm not saying we shouldn't be careful I'm not saying we shouldn't plan ahead I'm not saying we shouldn't you know shop wisely um, exactly Mm -hmm. Exactly. So if, if we prepare to reserve for that, it just means that they have some water. Yeah. <laughs> we are to look at the ant. We're to be like the ant. We're to prepare. In some ways, it's like the shopping habits of my wife and I. We shop about once a month. And it looks incredibly ridiculous going through the checkout at Walmart with two to three grocery carts. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Usually you do. Um, one, you figure I only have so much trunk space in the car. <laughs> and two, you get what's important to get home and, and you've got to store it at home for a month anyway. Uh, but in doing that, you're laying up for this month's provision. So you're not driving every week down. Um, so there is that aspect of provision. The provision, like being like an ant and laying up for the, the rainy day and for winter becomes a problem when it, it is the source of your dependence, not God. When you're being dependent so you can be considered responsible, you're actually taking pride in your own work, not saying, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best, I'm going to plan ahead, I'm going to prepare for winter, but if it all gets wiped out, I'm still depending on God. And that's happened. You know, the, the, the farmer who farms he's prepared for winter he's he's done all that and then a fire comes through and burns down his field it's all gone every bit of it and he, it, it, he still has to be dependent on God see here the third temptation not mentioned here uh, but but maybe this is the root temptation of why these other two come to, into place food can can very easily become an idol uh, we can eat to satisfy our emotions, whether to be happy, we may eat to celebrate, which I don't want to say that's a bad thing, because guess what? All through Scripture, you have feasts and celebrations, and what does God tell them to do with those? Eat. <laughs> yeah. However, we can, um, we can be kind of feeling a little down, and we eat food to make us feel better. We think somehow by satisfying our stomach, we're going to satisfy our emotions. Uh, we can eat because we're upset or to calm ourselves down. We can eat because we're stressed uh, or, or upset to smooth ourselves out. And, and we can blame it on anything. And you can, you can find all sorts of secular food people to tell you all the reasons we eat. You know, we, we sometimes eat just because the food's there. We don't need it. We may not really even want it, but it's there, so we eat it. And, oh, that's even a point. I forgot. I didn't even read it. So food becomes an idol when we seek it instead of meeting, to meet our needs instead of seeking God. And I think it's important to remember Ecclesiastes 5.19. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof, so to eat of the goodness of your riches and wealth, and to take his portion, only a portion, and to rejoice in his labor, it is the gift of God. So we need to enjoy the food God has given us. We can eat to celebrate, to be happy. But I think today we fall into the trap of, well, the world's eating patterns. And not understanding, I mean, maybe our wallet spends too much on money when we could spend it uh, money on food and, and when we could have spent it on other things. Um, so, thoughts, questions as we close up this lesson? Food, scarcity, and abundance. Uh, we are definitely living in a time when food is, is easily accessible, when food is, um, in America, food flows. Um, I'll tell this, I've told several of you before, but we go to this food pantry every time we go to Denver. And when my wife and I go, we take our trailer and things, and um, 
then we get it here and then try to get it out to anybody who can use it. It blows my mind. There's this church down there. They go to the food pantry. They have this huge trailer they take. And every week they deal with between five to 7,000 pounds of food. Now put your mind around that. Five to 7,000 pounds of food that gets given away for free every week. And we read about children in America who are starving. Why do you think that is? It's usually responsibility of parents. The food is there, or guardian, or whatever. There's maybe abuse or whatever. Um, bef- yeah. There's a lot of that. And so I guess that's a topic for another day. But anyway, any comments, questions before we close out? All right, let's pray. And I actually ended early. Father, we thank you for the day you've given us. And Lord, we thank you for the the gift of food. Now, Lord, would we be like Paul and be willing to be content when we are hungry and willing to be rejoice to rejoice when we are full? Would we not uh, let the food in our life become an idol? Would we not complain when we don't have as much or don't have what we want? Would we not forget you when we have abundance? Lord, we thank you for um, your word and what it has to say on this very practical subject. Would we ask that you'd bless our service to follow in your son's name. Amen.